Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be here kicking off this year's conference. Uh, as mentioned, I'm going to be talking about analyzing transit data, uh, specifically taxis, Ubers, and city bikes. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Todd Schneider. Uh, you can find the stuff I've written on my blog, which is toddwschneider.com. Uh, this is just sort of like a personal, fun side project. Uh, and so, you know, what, what was it actually? Uh, or sorry, what will I talk about? Which is, of course, taxi, Uber, and city bike data. I'll spend some time talking a little more generically about what I call medium data analysis and what that means. And of course, uh, where does R fit in? This is the R conference. Uh, R is one tool. It's a great tool that I love. It's not the only tool. Uh, so I'll talk about that too. Uh, so the taxi and Uber data blog post is something I wrote in November uh, using over a billion uh, taxi trips and Uber trips from the past six years. Uh, I then followed that up a few months later with a city bike post, did something similar with city bikes data. This one had the fun uh, element of a little animation that sort of each of those little blue dots is like a, a little city bike running around the city over the course of a day. And so what, what does all this mean? What is, where does this data come from? Uh, well, in the case of taxi and Uber data, uh, the TLC posted a giant data set of basically over a billion trips on their website. Every trip has uh, latitude and longitude coordinates for where it picked up, where it dropped off, uh, timestamps for when it happened. Uh, there's also similar data available from Uber, thanks to a freedom of information request, which means you can like ask the government for some data, and they will sometimes give it to you. Uh, city bike data is posted on their website as well. Every month, they post every trip. Similar style data, latitude, longitude, timestamps. City bike also provides a little bit of demographic data, uh, so the age of riders, their gender, things like that. Uh, and so the tools used uh, in this particular, these particular projects, PostgreSQL uh, as a SQL database, PostGIS is a geographic information system. I'll get into what that means in a sec. Uh, R, I think probably everyone here is at least loosely familiar with. Uh, command line tools come in handy, especially for doing sort of a lot of the pre-processing of the data, like text processing to fix data problems. Uh, and JavaScript for the sort of nice web interactivity. And uh, all the code is in these GitHub repositories, which I would encourage you to check out for the details on your own time. Uh, so, I always sort of think of any project like this in kind of a generic overview, which has basically always the same structure of you know, getting the data, processing the data into something more useful, doing your analysis, and then summarizing what you learned, whether that's writing, a presentation, whatever it might be. Uh, so you know, getting into it, starting with the raw data processing, what, what are we trying to accomplish when we, when we do the raw data processing? Uh, and I think of it as you know, we're taking a bunch of flat files. Uh, they could be in different formats, who knows? And we're trying to unify them into a single database uh, which we can then use to ask questions, answer those questions uh, about the data. Uh, we also, during the pre-processing, can do some sort of one-time calculations uh, to augment the data. And a specific example here for taxi and city bike data is uh, we want to be able to ask sort of neighborhood-based questions in New York. So we get latitude, longitude, but it doesn't really help you say you know, how many city bikes are there on the Upper West Side or something like that. Uh, and so we go through this extra step of mapping coordinates to specific census tracts, and that lets us uh, later ask more sort of geography, neighborhood-based questions, which are, of course, the interesting ones for people who live in New York. Uh, so the reality, raw data processing, this is probably something a lot of you are familiar with, is that it's messy, uh, it's annoying, not a lot of fun, frustrating, bang your head into the wall a lot. Uh, but I would say it's extremely important. Uh, it's really critically important. It's the foundation on which any data analysis is done. Uh, and if you don't do a good job kind of making sure your raw data is in the right format, uh, you're really going to hurt yourself later when it comes time to do the analysis. Um, so I don't know why I included this, but a picture of a CSV file, in case you've never seen one. Uh, it's got some numbers, some commas, some headers. Uh, very nice. Uh, so some specific issues I encountered with the taxi data, which was pretty messy, and the corresponding emoji for how sort of annoying I found each problem. Uh, the winner goes to the last one, which is uh, some files, which you know, had a header row that says there's 18 columns in each row. And then most of the rows have 18 columns, but some of the rows had 16 or 20 uh, with no sort of indication of what the extra or missing columns were. Uh, so that, that's pretty frustrating. Uh, just a quick note, you know, how to load all this stuff into the database. So the taxi data is you know, 300 gigabytes or something like that. But it sounds daunting. You, know, you can just break it into chunks and do one file at a time. This is where also command line tools come in handy. Uh, you can write a little bash script that just loops through each file. So really, you can, you can boil it down to make sure you can handle one file. Uh, and then you know, just write a loop, and that's just time. And again, details on GitHub, uh, which you can check out. Uh, so I mentioned mapping latitude and longitude to census tracts. How are we going to do this? We're going to use something called PostGIS. 
uh, what is published is it's a geographic information system, which is a fancy way of saying a thing that can calculate whether a point is inside a polygon. Uh, and that is relevant for this, because if you imagine every taxi trip or bike ride, uh, the pick up and drop off points are points, uh, and a census tract is a polygon. Uh, and so we can say, you know, for each ride, what polygon did it start and end in? Uh, so if you don't know about census tracts, uh, you know, New York is divided into about 2,000 of them. There's a picture that can you know, kind of give you a sense of how big they are. They're picked to have about 4,000 people in each of them. Uh, New York's also uh, broken into 200 neighborhood tabulation areas, which are collections of census tracts. And the, uh, the NTAs are things with names you'd recognize, like Upper West Side, Chinatown, and so on. Uh, a shapefile is another relevant consideration here. If you've never heard of a shapefile, it's just a file format uh, that can represent geometries like points, lines, polygons. Uh, and crucially, you can download a lot of them publicly on the internet. So like New York City on their website has a shapefile uh, with all of the census tract definitions. Uh, so that's what I downloaded, important to post uh, And you get something that looks kind of like this. This is a, a single record, a single uh, census tract in PostGIS. Uh, it's a lot of gobbledygook. The bottom there, you can see like a bunch of latitude longitude coordinates where it says polygon, if you can read. But that's, that's basically the boundary of this particular census tract, which is on the Lower East Side. So you know, there's 2,000 of these. Uh, PostGIS has this function called st within, which takes two geometries, a and b, uh, and it returns true if and only if a is entirely within b. So again, extending this to our example here with taxi or bike trips, uh, you know, a is like the pickup or drop-off point. Uh, B is the tracked polygon. So for each trip, you can say, is it within each of the 2,000 polygons? And of course, that should only be true once, because they don't overlap. Uh, or it could be true zero times if the trip was not in New York City. Uh, so zero or one results for each of those. Uh, now there's a problem with this, which is that it turns out to be very slow. It's computationally intensive to figure out, is a point inside an arbitrary polygon? And uh, the way to deal with this is something called a spatial index. Uh, so what's a spatial index? Uh, here is a sort of picture of one. So we have this, poly this orange polygon, a census tract. Uh, we can draw this rectangular bounding box around it, sort of vertically oriented. And uh, why do we do that? And the answer is because it's pretty easy to figure out is a point inside the bounding box. Uh, and so the way it works, a spatial index, is you, you get these bounding boxes for all of your polygons. And then when you're checking, is a point inside the polygon, you do it in two steps. First, you say, is it inside the rectangular, the vertical rectangular bounding box, uh, which is an easy check, because all you have to do is check the x of your point against the x bounds of the rectangle. Same thing with y. Uh, and if it's not true, uh, you can just stop. You don't have to do the more expensive calculation. So, so most of the time, this first check, uh, which is the easy one, comes back false, and you don't have to do the expensive second step, saving yourself a lot of time. So putting it all together, uh, you know, we download all the data, we download our census tracts and the shape file, we create our indexes, we have this sort of bash script that loops through everything, fixes all the data problems, loads into our database. Uh, on my personal computer, this took three days, uh, so you know, go, go take a walk or something. Um, and you know, then you have, finally, your sort of data set ready to analyze. Uh, so that brings us to the analysis step, which is kind of the fun part where you get to ask interesting questions, figure out how you want to go out and attack them, uh, and just basically keep doing that until you uh, are satisfied. And so let's go through some examples here of the actual taxi, Uber, city bike stuff. Uh, so I showed you these maps before. Uh, this is motivated by the question of, you know, what does a, a map look like of every taxi pickup and drop off since 2009? Uh, and this is a good thing where R comes in, because R is very good at plotting. Uh, where you can just take a bunch of dots and plot them on a map. Uh, and I did this using R and ggplot2, and you end up with stuff that looks like this. Uh, so these are two maps. On the left, you have every taxi pickup. On the right, you have every drop off. Uh, there's higher resolution versions on my website you can check out. Uh, and again, these are just dots. There's no like roads on here or anything. It's just a bunch of dots. Uh, and I like looking at especially how, so obviously taxis are very uh, centrally located in Manhattan. Uh, but you can see that drop-offs tend to extend further out into the outer boroughs. Uh, you know, people after work, for example, you know, take a taxi from Manhattan out home to Brooklyn. Uh, fewer taxis pick up in Brooklyn, though. Uh, of course, the airports you can see out in Queens uh, are, are very popular spots as well. So this was fun. Uh, now, a problem with this, by the way, is that R, at least on my laptop, can't fit all billion rows. Uh, so what I did was did a little pre-processing by rounding the latitude longitude coordinates to four decimal points. Uh, which gives you accuracy to about 10 meters, count up the number of trips at each of those aggregated points, and then use that count to vary the sort of size and intensity of each dot on the map. 
And uh, you know, the code, which I'm not going to go through line by line, is really this is all it is. And it's just you know, pretty straightforward ggplot2 code. Uh, and really, I'd say, speaks to the power of R's plotting capabilities. Uh, so of course, you should always be questioning data reliability. Uh, you know, this was shared around the internet and a lot of comments like this, you know, people complaining. It's like nobody barrel rolls out of a cab on the Van Wyck. Uh, and you, know, you see uh, there are some dots uh, approaching JFK here. And of course, they're right. You know, like that, that is probably faulty data, almost certainly faulty data. Uh, don't know exactly why it's faulty. It could be that taxi meters are unreliable. It could be that taxi drivers you know, turn them on or off at the wrong time. Uh, the point is it's always important to be aware of limitations in the data uh, and you know, make sure you don't draw the wrong inference from that. Uh, so the city bike animation, uh, which Germania thinks should animate, there it goes, uh, you know, mapping the position of every city bike over a day, and this uses a couple different tools. Uh, so I got direction, cycling directions from the Google Maps API, uh, used leaflet.js for mapping a popular mapping library, and there's a library called Torque.js, which is by a New York startup called CardoDB, which does the actual animation. Uh, so that's cool. So you can imagine every trip, every bike trip, you know the station has started, you know the station had ended, you know the timestamps, you know the route, the suggested route, and so you just can, can interpolate basically at every second where each bike is, and you end up with this, this nice little you know, series of blue dots running around. Uh, so again, there's some assumptions here. This is like a static map of if you took just the total throughput on each road uh, of those blue dots, you would see something like this. Uh, and those four thick white lines in the middle are first, second, eighth, and ninth avenues. Uh, and the reason for that is Google Maps has a very strong uh, preference to send people on roads that have dedicated bike lanes. Uh, and those are the avenues in New York that have dedicated bike lanes. Uh, and you know, maybe that's reasonable, who knows? Uh, I don't actually know if people are you know, so inclined to go to the bike lane roads. But that's how Google Maps sends them. Uh, and again, it's just important to be aware that when you see the simulation, it's assuming everyone follows this set of rules that they don't necessarily. Uh, so here's another fun one with city bike, was modeling the relationship between the weather and city bike ridership. Uh, so if you look at a graph of city bike trips over time, it looks like this. Uh, usage is a lot higher in the summer, a lot lower in the winter, which is not terribly surprising. Uh, it's not very pleasant to ride a bike in New York in February. Uh, and so my question was, you know, can we use the weather to predict sort of the total ridership? And of course, we have the ridership data already. Uh, you can get daily weather data from the National Climatic Data Center. You can just download that online. Temperature, precipitation, snow, stuff like that. And again, this is the part where R shines you know, in devising and calibrating models uh, and just exploring the data. So I started, you know, just made some simple graphs. Uh, on the left here, you can see the relation between max daily temperature and ridership. And it, it notably follows this kind of nonlinear relationship where above 60 degrees, the changing the temperature doesn't really change the, the ridership all that much. Uh, but as it gets cold, uh, ridership drops off very quickly. And so this sort of the model uh, I came up with here, which isn't as complicated as it looks, uh, is really just kind of an S-curve where the inputs of the S-curve are all these weather variables. There's also some adjustments for like weekday, weekend, holiday, stuff like that. Uh, and what I wanted to highlight here is you know, calibrating these parameters in R. Uh, I use the minpack LM package, which has a levenberg markhardt optimizer, uh, which will let you just kind of minimize nonlinear squared error for whatever arbitrary model you choose. Uh, I guess arbitrary is a bit strong there. You should you know, be a little careful what you choose. Uh, but again, the code is here. I, I'd encourage you to check it out for the details. Uh, and then, of course, you can do some sort of validation, uh, look at your residuals, look at the fit. Uh, and I like in the bottom right here, it shows kind of this, this S curve that uh, from a very cold day to a very hot day, uh, the total predicted change in ridership is about 30,000 30, city bike rides. Uh, another fun one, to the extent you can call airport traffic fun, uh, is you know, how long is a ta your taxi going to take to get to the airport? Uh, so for this, you know, we have all the, trip, just the, all the trips that dropped off at one of the airports. We know where they started. So for each neighborhood at each time of day to each airport, uh, you can calculate the distribution of how long uh, a taxi trip takes to get there. So you end up with a bunch of graphs that look like this. It's just one. So we are in right now the Chelsea Flatiron Union Square neighborhood. Uh, if you were going to go to JFK, today's a weekday. It's a little after 9 AM. Uh, it looks like your median travel time would be you know, 42 minutes or something like that. Uh, and then, of course, if you're worried about the worst case scenario or a bad case, the 90th percentile uh, looks to be a little bit less than an hour, maybe 55 minutes. So if anyone right now has a flight to catch, which seems unlikely based on your being here, uh, you know, you'd be looking at somewhere between a 42 to you know, a little less than an hour, worst case, trip to JFK. Uh, so there's a bunch more, more fun stuff in the full posts. Don't have time to go through it all, but check it out. Uh, yeah. So I wanted to talk a bit 
generically about sort of what I call medium data analysis tips, just things that I've come across uh, in doing work like this. Question one is, of course, what is medium data, which is, I'm sure, a disputed term. Uh, the way I think of it is anything that's too big to fit in RAM, uh, but small enough to fit on a local hard disk. So you know, I have a MacBook Air. Uh, the data set I used here is a couple hundred, like 300 gigabytes. Uh, it fits on my hard drive. You know, it can be slow, but it fits. Um, so the, I think the most important thing is to use the right tools for the right job. And I've talked about most of these already. Uh, but PostgreSQL, great SQL database uh, for just kind of storing, aggregating the data, geospatial calculations with the PostGIS extension. Uh, R really excels at modeling and plotting. Command line tools are useful for processing data and doing kind of like the loading. Uh, Ruby, which I didn't mention, is a good general programming language I use for making API calls, scraping websites, stuff like that. Uh, and then JavaScript is important if you want to make some you know, sort of interactive thing on the web. Uh, one link I just wanted to highlight is R PostgreSQL. This is, of course, the R conference. Uh, there is a package called R PostgreSQL, which I've always found to be extremely useful. Uh, it lets you, you know, just query Postgres from within R, uh, which, again, just to emphasize, you, know, you can use each uh, piece of technology for what it's good at, uh, which in Postgres's case is just storing and you know, number crunching. And for R, at least for me, is calibrating and plotting. Uh, another tip I've come across is to do what I call pre-aggregation. Uh, so I, I gave an example of this with the taxi maps where we truncated the, the latitude longitude. Uh, another example is you, know, so you have this full taxi data, which is over a billion rows, very unwieldy, takes a long time to query. Uh, you can make this intermediate table, uh, which is for each you know, census tract, for each timestamp truncated to the nearest hour, how many trips were there. Uh, and that ends up being about a 30 million row table. Uh, which, of course, doesn't have nearly as much information as the full table, but it's much easier to work with. You can still use it for a lot of the analysis you're going to do, uh, and you just save a lot of time. If one time you can create this intermediate table, which will, will end up being useful. Uh, so that is you know, just think about how you're going to use the data. Are there any intermediate aggregated tables you can create to, to help you speed up your calculations? And uh, so the last thing I want to talk about, you know, you've done all this hard work to analyze, now you're going to summarize it. Uh, you know, how to get people to read your work. This is kind of a, a weird one because you know, I think most people here have a, a technical mind, but you know, also you have to do a little bit of salesmanship, I would say. Uh, you know, today on the internet, if you're posting on your blog, everyone has a million things they could be looking at. Uh, and so it's a challenge to get them to focus on what you've done. Uh, and so I think the first rule here is that whatever you do has to be good, has to be interesting. And the most important thing is that you have to be interested in it, because if you're not interested and excited, probably nobody else is either. Uh, and then you know, I think also I like to think about, given that how, pe how distracted people are, uh, you have to make sure that you can sort of hook them in quickly, let them understand you know, easily what you're writing about. And uh, I also like to say that often the questions you ask, the sort of interesting questions you can ask, uh, are more important than the methods you choose to answer them. Uh, so some specific tips about writing, and these come kind of silly, but you know, Write in short paragraphs, make sure you have plenty of pictures. I think the easiest way to get people to abandon your site on the internet is to have a big wall of text. Uh, so avoid that. Uh, and that, those are some of the things I think about when I'm at least you know, writing a blog post. Uh, and so this is my last slide. Uh, you know, just sort of above all, if you're going to do a project like this, make sure you're having fun. Uh, and you know, always have an inquisitive mind, especially if you live here in New York or really anywhere. There's tons of stuff going on around you. Uh, there's tons of data that's probably already collected, or maybe you can do a little bit of work to collect. Uh, so you know, think about it, ask interesting questions about it, figure out what you can do to go out and answer those questions, and uh, have fun doing it. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. <laughs>